I can't wait until things get back to normal. Are you with me? If I had a dollar for every time I heard that, I, I would be a rich man and probably you would too. We are in a season of uncomfortable waiting. We're in a season where things aren't like we want them to be. And you know what? It's wonderful that the scripture speaks directly to those needs. We're going to be talking about faithful waiting. And I, I was thinking about how simple it is for us to wish our lives away. You know, when you're 15, you can't wait till you're 16, and then you can drive. And, and when you're 16, you can't wait till you're 18 and you're out of school. And, and when you're 18, you can't wait until you're 21. And then you can't wait until you have a job. And then you can't wait till you get married. And, and when you get married, you can't wait till you have kids. And then you can't wait for your kids to get bigger. And then you can't wait for your kids to start doing well in school. And then you can't wait for your kids to leave. And then you, you, can't, you wish you were 25 again. And then we, we can spend our whole lives wishing we were somewhere else. And, and I think the power of the lessons that we're looking at in Hebrews chapter 11, as we look through this uh, wonderful hall of faith, of characters from the old scripture that are there to inspire us and encourage us, and, and so much of their journey is believing that God is speaking and then waiting and trusting him and obeying him in the middle of that waiting. And so this is a, a very pertinent passage of scripture for this point in time. But we are particularly focusing, as Pastor Craig already said, we are looking at not only the story that we looked at with Pastor Will last week of Abraham and God specifically calling him out of a, a pagan nation and saying, I want you to, to leave there and go, and by the way, I'll tell you before you get there, I'll tell you where you're going to land, but I'm not going to tell you now. And so he, he heads out as this nomad living in tents and, and living in expectation and the other part of that story is Sarah, because God's promise is winding its way all the way through Abraham's story, and he says to him, come and I will give you a land, and then he says, and I will make you a great nation, and specifically there's this phrase, you will have children like the sand of the seashore and the stars of the heaven, and, and that promise, incredible and powerful as it is, has some big, huge obstacles, because first of all, he has a wife who is not able to have children. They have dealt with infertility all along. And now at this point, she's 65 years old and she's not more likely to have children now. And there's this incredible stretch where God gives him this promise. You're gonna be this nation, but you don't have any children. And then it goes year after year after year of waiting. And so as we looked at last week, uh, they tried the, the Hagar option. They tried the Let's see if we can do it our way. And God was quick to say, no, that is not acceptable. In fact, he said, the child will come through Sarah. So we have looked at Abraham and how he was called, but let me say this clearly. Sarah was exactly as called as Abraham was. The, the other half of this vision, the other half of having a child had to have not only any woman, but Sarah. So she was called. And so in Hebrews chapter 11, we have this hall of faith and it goes down and it's looked at the character of Abraham. And then in the middle of it, it says, and by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. I want you to hear that phrase right there because that's gonna be something we come back to that it's not about the promise itself, it's about the faithfulness of the promiser. That she thought that God was going to keep his promise, she trusted him. And then it goes on and it says, and so from this one man, and he is good as dead. That, that always makes me smile. Sarah is past childbearing age, but Abraham, he's as good as dead. And it says, he came, from them came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and countless as the sands on the seashore. So you see that promise again that was given in Genesis and it's been fulfilled. But in this little succinct summary, it looks like it was easy. It looks like promise fulfilled. See, it happened. And sometimes when we look at that part of the story, it can be discouraging because that doesn't happen to us. We see God at work and we see it in bits and snatches, but but we don't see the whole thing. And I think it's really helpful for us to go back and, and to look at that Sarah's faith made her deeper, that it was a process, that it was messy, that there were years involved, and there was times when people, even of great faith, struggle 
with a disbelief or with a lack of faith. And so we have the privilege as we're talking about this very human problem, but particularly in this case, the, the problem of infertility. And I think what better passage of scripture to get a woman's heart and a woman's perspective on. And it's cool because we have a, a young woman who is a part of our green campus. She's the administrator there and a worship leader there. And in many, many ways, her story parallels Sarah. And so I wanna have Jamie Ketchum, if you would come on. And we wanna hear a little bit about this incredible way in which her story mirrors yours or your story mirrors hers. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and how you see the parallels? Yeah. Hi, Family Church. Uh, so, really, I don't remember a time where I didn't attend church, I, but I do distinctly remember at five years old in my Sunday school class being the one and only person to raise their hand at the end of service, and I was ready. So I went up in front with my Sunday school teacher, and I prayed through the ABCs. I, A, admitted I was a sinner. B, I believed that Christ really lived really died and really rose again. And I see I was ready to commit my life to following him. And of course that looks different at five than it does now, but it was at that point in time that shift started to occur. And by junior high, I was serving in the nursery and the kids ministry. By high school, I was starting to serve in the junior high ministry. And I really felt pressed and called by God that I was supposed to be a mom. And not just a mom, a mom of many. And this promise that God laid on my heart was so intense at such a, such a young age that when I found out at 18 that I would be unable to carry my own children, that I wasn't infertile in the truest sense of the word, but that I wouldn't be the one that could carry my children, I really had to wrestle. I had to wrestle with the thought of, is this the death sentence to my life calling? Or do I need to step out in faith? Is this the first true test of my faith in this promise that God has called me to? Am I willing to believe unswervingly that this is what he's called me to and to take that next step no matter what that looks like? And being single and 18, I wasn't ready to get married or have children anytime soon. So really the first step of faith that I could think of was to start saving because I knew having children not me carrying them, so either through surrogacy or adoption, it was going to be expensive. Wow, I can't imagine what that must have been like it, to have this dream and then all of a sudden have a train wreck, have, have an obstacle. And, and you had in some ways the same kind of obstacle that Sarah had. So I'm trying to think through and, and I, I love that picture of you starting to save money and starting to do something practical in the middle of all of this. But I'm also thinking that must have made Dating and looking at marriage, that must have made that a little awkward. Uh, yeah, more like non-existent. I really, I wasn't ready to have that conversation multiple times. Really, I knew that the person that I was supposed to marry, I was going to have that conversation once. And so when I met Drew. And here he is. Oh, we look like such babies. <laughs> Uh, when I met Drew, uh, three months into our relationship, we had started talking about marriage, and I knew that that was the point in time where I'd have to have that conversation. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a very direct person. I'm a verbal processor, and I'm going to lay it all out on the table. So I was ready, and I had everything, and I just put it out there. And um, Drew is the exact opposite of me. He is quiet, he's an internal processor, and he's a man of very few words. So his response was, okay. And we moved on, and honestly, I didn't think I'd see him again after that day. <laughs> That's a great picture, isn't it? Okay, and, and you had other conversations after that, yes. and of course. To be fair to Drew, and, and to show his true heart behind this, his okay was meant that he was on board. He didn't need to say any more than that. He believed that this was the marriage relationship that we were both being called into, and it didn't matter what obstacles were put in our way. This is a calling. This is what God's called us to. We're going to pursue it both together. And so okay simply meant okay. <laughs> if you have few words, you got to choose the right ones. Right. Um, and so I see the parallels there. You've got this promise. It's kind of an identity factor in your life, and then, and then this incredible obstacle. And, and I think it's really good when we look at the characters in Scripture that those stories are messy. Hebrews 11 makes it look kind of 
you know, succinct and easy. And then we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to look at some of those pieces. So, so here we are in Genesis chapter 12. Here's one of the messy pieces. So it says, And as he, which is Abraham, was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Now, ladies, just a spoiler alert. If a man starts a conversation with that phrase, it, you better, better be careful. So he says, When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. We're gonna go into this new hostile territory. I'm afraid, so here's what let's do. Let's call you my sister instead of my wife. Now, I don't know how that strikes you, Jamie, but how do you think Sarah must have felt? How would you feel? Well, first of all, it is important to point out, at this point in time, Sarah is 65 years old and a total (laughs) smoke show because the Pharaoh wants to have her for his harem. And at this point, like you had said, they are a nomadic culture. So they've been called into this. They don't have safety. They are moving everywhere they're going and they are entering into hostile territory. So to go in as the husband, it would be easy for him to be killed and the wife to be taken. But to go in as her brother, he had the safety. He held all the cards because the Pharaoh, the king would come to them and ask for her hand, and actually pay handsomely for her. And spoiler alert, this happens again when she's 90. That's a big deal. But her heart behind it, I can only imagine at this point feeling abandoned and objectified and like a bargaining chip between her husband and the Pharaoh. It really draws back to the fact that while she's beautiful, She's barren, and her beauty has become dangerous. Yeah, and and as I respond to that, I look at Abraham, and as a man, I look at that, and I think, man, this is exactly what husbands are not supposed to do. This is self-serving, self-focused leadership, and he's basically saying, I've got an asset here, my wife is gorgeous, and therefore, I am going to work it to my advantage uh, instead of making me at risk. And in the New Testament, God calls us as as husbands to, to lay down our lives and (laughs) <laughs> and Abraham is laying down his wife. I mean, this he's doing exactly the opposite. And, and I think it's important that the Bible tells us that these people that are great images of faith, man, they didn't always do it right, and they had places where they failed, and yet, in the journey, God used that difficulty. And, and let me just say this, a time of waiting and a time of difficulty is great soil for the growth of faith. When everything's going fine, when you see all the promises that just come like that, there's no development of faith. There's no deepening. And and, and you mentioned these two things, and I think that's really interesting. At this point, if you look at Sarah, these are probably two big, I don't know, core identities for her. How, How do you see that? Well, we look at her beauty, which I feel like in today's culture, we can totally identify with that. We, as women, are asked to uphold unrealistic, (laughs) impossible standards of beauty. But in her culture, her barrenness was even more so. If you were unable to produce a male heir, you were looked down on. This This was an important thing in her culture. And for that identity to be tied to something like that, that was hard, knowing that she'd been promised this, right? We see this weaving of this promise all through this, and yet that is still a primary source of her identity at this point. And that's why we're talking about making her deeper because it's clear, even though these are the, the key elements of the story at this point, that in the, in the New Testament, in uh, 1 Peter 3, where we, we see a, another major reference to Sarah, he, he's called, she's called a holy woman. And uh, Peter writes and says, ladies, let me tell you the example you need to have. And, and the deepening, instead of here's a beautiful woman or here's a woman that was barren, as those the markers of her identity, he now says, you know what, she's called a holy woman. So in 1 Peter 3, uh, he says it like this, and he's, this is a pastor's challenge to the women in his church. He says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles, the wearing of gold jewelry, and fine clothes. Does that sound like it could totally fit in our culture? And he's not saying those are absolutely off, off, out of balance. Those are wrong. He's saying that your beauty doesn't come from that, Rather, it should be of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. 
For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah. And I had never really thought about this until we came to this message, that this whole discussion of beauty, he pulls from the story of Sarah, who is obviously a great beauty, and he's saying that there was two kinds of beauty involved. How does that relate? How do you relate to that as a woman? Well, I see, I see the transition from that outward, external beauty that then goes deeper, that really to that beauty that doesn't fade, that internal beauty of a quiet spirit, that submission. And I look at Sarah's story and I see that. I see that God didn't rescue her out of those situations um, with the Pharaoh, with the kings, but he protected her. And he was able to produce in her that quiet spirit, that belief, that, that knowing that that promise was going to be fulfilled and that reminder that he who promised is faithful. And I see that um, a lot kind of paralleling in my story. I think about that. My life verse has always been Hebrews 10, 23. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And I had to wrestle through a lot of times of doubt and questioning whether this would happen. Even after Drew and I um, got married and we're, we're having those questions come in of, when are we gonna have kids? And so we struggled through that together, but I had to decide, am I going to swerve to the right or to the left? Am I gonna remember that this is the promise God's called me to even in the waiting? And, and there's no way to build that faith without that period of difficulty and struggle and waiting. It's part of the essential piece of it. And so I think it's really important for us to, to talk about the fact that faith is a journey. That people of great faith did not get there overnight, and they did not get there painlessly or easily. And so we talk about taking faith steps, and faith steps are always in the present. And here is the story in the messy middle, and in fact, there's another messy piece to it. Not only does Abraham, you know, sort of totally abandon his responsibility as a husband, but now we have another situation in which after 24 years of waiting, they have some visitors at their house and, and three people come and uh, Abraham invites them for dinner and says, Sarah, fix us dinner. And they're sitting and talking and in the dialogue it becomes obvious that these are messengers from God. In fact, I, I think probably the, the key messenger is actually Jesus appearing in the Old Testament, which does happen. And, and they're telling Abraham that the promise is definitely gonna happen. So this promise was repeated several times in this 25 years of waiting. And, and so we're 24 years into it. And they say, yes, you and Sarah will have a son. In fact, they, they say by this time next year. So finally, they're getting a timeline. And, and what's Sarah's response to that? Well, first of all, she's on the inside of the tent. She's not actually in the middle of this conversation. But for those of you who've ever camped before, you know that there's no secrets. You <laughs> standing on the other side of the flap. But she's listening and she hears and she laughs, but not like a excited, happy laugh. This is a, right, this has been 24 years. You've said this over and over. And it's a laugh of disbelief, of bitterness, of, of sadness, of knowing that this has happened this long and yet nothing has come from it. And so we'd say that was a laughter of disbelief and guys, just to be uh, equal and fair, it also, and I didn't realize this either, but in chapter 17, it says Abraham does the same thing. He falls on his faith, face and he laughs in unbelief. It's this, I can't believe it, which isn't to say that they didn't trust God at all. It's just to say there are moments when it's really hard and the struggle is real and we, we have those moments of disbelief. And, and the cool part of this story as we walk through it in Genesis is then we see some of the fulfillment and, and we move to that place where this theme of laughter, God uses it to, to sort of make a bookmark in, in a key part of this journey. So in, in Genesis 21, the, the story's now fast forwarded a year. They are, have been able to have a child. And here's what Sarah says. She uses that same theme. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. But now she's seen the, the fulfillment or at least the beginning of that fulfillment. And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. So this is the laughter of joy. And then she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. 
And, and we were looking at that little piece of the, the laughter of disbelief and then the laughter of, of seeing some of the fulfillment. And I did not realize that back in Genesis 17, God had said, yes, but your wife Sarah, she's called as much as you are, will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. And if you don't know the meaning of that name, you would miss that. But the, the, the word Isaac means laughter. That God bookmarks this, even though you laughed in disbelief, I caused you to laugh as you saw the fulfillment of that. And I want all the children of Israel and all followers of God everywhere, I want you to realize that in those moments of temptation, you may laugh in disbelief, but ultimately, the one who made the promise is faithful. It's about the promiser, not the the specific promise that we cling to. And so, in your story, Jamie, uh, you fast forward a long ways from 18, and what is your story now? Well, we're right in the middle of it. <laughs> and here's a picture of the middle of it. Uh, so if you watched the message six or so months ago, my family looked completely different. Um, and that is the joy and the challenge of being in the middle of doing foster care. We do have a biological daughter, Maria. She's now five. And um, we are in the process of adopting Dean. And we are now preteen parents as of two months ago. And we are really living in the midst of what God has called us to uh, Just to go back a little bit on that point, I totally can echo what Sarah was feeling in that moment of laughing in disbelief. I remember so distinctly after we got married and people started asking us, when are we gonna have kids? When are we gonna have kids? And you laugh at first, but that laugh turns into bitterness because they don't know that internal shame that I'm wearing and they don't understand the pain that that brings and the reminder of the promise that is yet to be fulfilled. And then that transition to joy as we start to see God using us to come about. And really, this is God's story. He's writing it, and we get to be a part of it by bringing these kids into our lives. In fact, it's kind of funny when you hear the story of Sarah. It's like, she has a baby, and everybody's rejoicing. And we all know that having a child is the answer to all your dreams and all your needs. I mean, children are there to fulfill you, right? It's even that fulfillment. A child is not a nation. A child is not, one kid is not, Stars of the, si- of the sky and sand of the seashore, you know? So even in the fulfillment of a part of that, it's still the messy middle, isn't it? And that's where we need to have that faith. Yep. Well, thank you, Jamie, for sharing your story and for your faith and Sarah's faith that helped to inspire ours. Thanks, Thanks. for sharing. So we are talking about this waiting and how do we have faith? And, and, and I... I remember hearing a message years ago, and, and it talked about this, this simple phrase that faith helps hold us in the land between. And specifically, he was talking about the story later in Abraham's journey. There's the children of Israel come out of Abraham, and, and they are trapped in Egypt as slaves, and then God uses Moses to bring them out. And that's, again, a moment of great triumph, the 10 plagues crossing the Red Sea. Then there's 40 years of wandering in the desert before they get into the promised land. And in that time, uh, the, the speaker that was talking about this land between said, all of the temptations and all of the struggles and all of the difficulties that come in the land between. And, and remember at the beginning how I said we're always waiting for something and it's easy for us to wish our lives away. It is difficult to remain faithful, to follow God in the land between. There's a couple of struggles in it. One of them is it's easy to get caught in the past. Uh, We've talked through this series about the fact that God gives us the spiritual armor of a shield of faith. And specifically, the shield of faith is to extinguish the fiery darts, the fiery arrows of the enemy. And, And those fiery arrows, as we've been trying to name them through this series, it's not the hole they make, it's the fire they start. And, and it can come out of that sense of worthlessness because I, I am not, I'm not able to have children or sense of waiting as, God, I feel like you've promised that I will find a, a godly spouse and that hasn't happened or, or the, the promise that whatever that promise might be, you're looking for and it hasn't happened. And, and in the middle of that time of waiting, there's all kinds of challenges and, and some of those challenges focus on the rearview mirror. Why did this have to happen to me? How could, how could that have been what your plan is, God, it was so painful and violating and shameful or whatever that is. 
We can also get caught in the past and it was the good old days and life used to be better and, and now we're heading into a dark and scary future. And, and, and if you think about the story of the children of Israel, they had been slaves, but sometimes in the desert they kept saying, oh, I wish we could go back to Egypt. <laughs> we sat around there and had leeks and garlics and, and, and they were glorifying the past even though they had been slaves. But he's talking about that it's easy to get caught in the past. In fact, when we look at this Hebrews chapter 11, going back to the verses right after he talks about Sarah, he goes on and he says, and all these people were still living by faith. Now, we've already got partway through the list and there's gonna be other people beyond that, but he says they were still living by faith when they died. You think, wait a minute, Abraham and Sarah had Isaac and they they got to see it, but they only got to see a little piece of it. They hadn't received the, you'll be a great nation and all nations will be blessed because of you. They did not receive the things that were promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Isn't that a great, isn't that a great active statement? When we talk about this active waiting, this active faith, it's not lazy boy faith where I just sit there and let God work and I'm just gonna hope something happens. It says, they welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things, people who live by faith in the in-between, show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they had left, they could have, gone, they could have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So, he says clearly we have a hope and a promise that's ahead of us and that promise ultimately is that we're gonna be in heaven and we're gonna be together with God forever and, and that's like the, the big promise that, that Abraham and Sarah had that they would be a nation that would bless all nations. But what about now? What, what about the, the future for us now? And I think it's easy for us to be very, very anxious. There's so many news sources and conversations and Facebook and Instagram that, that are stirring up all this anxiety about what if and what might and, and what if it won't. And I believe that God's promise for us is not only the promise of heaven in the future, his promise is that he said he would never leave us or forsake us, that he will walk with us. And so God's desire, and, and listen carefully, it is so hard to live in the present it's so easy to, to get caught in the past or to be fearful of the future. It's, it's hard to live in the moment where we are, allowing God to walk with us and to help us to be patient and joyful and gentle as we walk through this process. And so I, I think of those fiery, fiery darts, the fiery arrows, and Jamie mentioned the feeling that when they couldn't have children and people kept asking them, she didn't want to talk about it. It was, it was a shame. And sometimes that, that arrow of shame can come in and start a fire. Or the doubt, is God really good? Or did God really say that? Or <laughs> I trust God, but I don't trust his people. And, and, I, and I'm fearful of that. Or live in the fear of the future or bitterness. And, and on your outline, there's just three blanks there. Maybe it's worthlessness. There's other arrows like lust and greed and escapism and and I want you to kind of wrestle with that question. In my time of waiting, what are the arrows that I have to deal with regularly? What, what arrows do I have to learn to extinguish? And I think if we're honest, our, our brains go all kinds of different places in every given day. And yet there's often these patterns and you start thinking, Lord, what is Satan's design to keep me from faithfully trusting in you? And so I believe if we were to to look at the examples of scripture, that's awesome. And it's wonderful to see Drew and Jamie and how they're operating in the present. And I also want to just mention, I, I was the privileged person who got to help officiate a celebration of life for a faithful woman named Julie Brizendine. And, and I want to tell you that this woman who has had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, for the last 17 years was such a marker of faith for us because... She had an active faith. She was literally imprisoned in her own body. And every time I would get a little irritated about being stuck in my house, I would think, man, that's nothing like being in prison. She, at the end, couldn't even talk and could barely breathe and couldn't move any of her extremities. 
And you know what she did? She prayed and she expressed joy and she shared as much as she could with as many people as she could about how Jesus had given her life meaning and purpose. And we did an interview on her and we did that in 2010 and we played that at her memorial service. And it was again a reminder that this active trust and this active living with God in the land between is what he's called all of us to. And it is difficult, especially in times when we feel like we're not sure we're ever gonna get what was promised. So let me, let me give you to this as just a way to think about how our faith is to be in light of the promises, in light of the, the pain of waiting. Faith builds on the past. I've said it's a history lesson. We need to look at the stories of other people of faith and let them inspire us. It gives hope for the future. No matter what's coming at us right now, God is with us and ultimately we know how the story is going to turn out and that allows me to be joyfully present now. And, and I know that that doesn't happen all the time and it's not without any breaks, but I think that's God's goal for us is that we live joyfully present in the now Instead of waiting till things get back to normal, instead of waiting till I'm older, instead of waiting till I get this money, instead of wishing our lives away, that we are trusting God, that we are being obedient to God in the now. And in fact, there's a, a song that was mentioned to me, which is a powerful song that helped people. It's called In the Waiting by John Waller. And it says, I'm waiting on you, Lord, and I am hopeful. I'm waiting on you, Lord, though it is painful and patiently I will wait. I will move ahead, bold and confident, taking every step in obedience. And then he says this, while I'm waiting, I will serve you. While I'm waiting, I will worship. While I'm waiting, I will not faint. I'll be running the race even while I wait. Isn't that good? What a great description of of that active faith that says, God, I am gonna be doing whatever I can do in this time of waiting to serve you, to worship you, to love you, to respond to you instead of react to the circumstances around us. I'd like to pray for all of us and I want you to pray about those fiery arrows that maybe you're dealing with right now and pray for the right heart and that active faith that gets built in the struggle and in the wait. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Sarah's story and Jamie's story and Julie's story and Lord, many other men and women of faith that I know who have gone through times of great difficulty, who've had to endure suffering for long periods of time and yet who have considered you to be faithful, that they know that it's not just the specific promise, it's the promiser and that you've promised you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us, that you are living with us in the journey. Father, I pray that you would re-enliven our faith, that for those who are discouraged, for those who maybe are dealing with infertility or just dealing with this COVID crisis or dealing with family struggles, that you would assure them that in the middle of it, you are going to be present. In the middle of it, you are going to give them what they need. In the middle of it, they can grow, they can worship, they can serve. So Father, help us to get our minds reoriented, get our lives aligned to trust and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to release to the different people who are watching. If you're watching online from far away, if you're not with anybody, then I want you just to, to take a look and think about what are those arrows that I need to struggle with in the season of waiting and how can God how can God help me to learn by faith to extinguish those and not let them dominate my thinking? If you're watching with a fellowship group, you may want to divide into groups of three or four. And if you're at one of our campuses, there will be a host there that will kind of help you maybe tamp this down and think about how you can make it really applicable to your life. We're so glad you've joined us. Trust that God will use this to help deepen you and make you a more faithful person.